All right, good morning. Welcome to Sunday School. This is our final Doctrines of Grace class where we are going to talk about covenant theology in 45 minutes, the day before VBS. Ted Lasso says, taking on a challenge is a lot like riding a horse, isn't it? If you're comfortable while you're doing it, you're probably doing it wrong. That's the story of today. Covenant theology in 45 minutes is a tall order. Y'all ready? Ready to buckle up? Here we go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you give grace, and you, Lord, um, are a tutor. Your word leads us to Christ. So thank you so much for your patience with us. I pray that you would open up your word as we look at it from a particular angle today, that you would illuminate it, Lord, and it would not just be an exercise in analysis, but one that enriches your word for us. Thank you, Lord, for the grace you give us, even in this moment. And I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified. And it's in your precious name that I pray. Amen. All right, so outlines and handouts are making their way around. Today we're talking about covenant theology. We're going to ask a few questions. What is covenant theology? What is a covenant? And we'll go through the different types of covenants, and we're going to work out the implications of what covenant theology means for us. All right? So let's jump right in, because like I said, we don't have that much time. What is covenant theology? Covenant theology is an approach to biblical interpretation that blends insights from both systematic theology and biblical theology. Now, you may have heard those terms, you may have not. What does that mean? What is systematic theology? Systematic theology traces and arranges different themes in Scripture, and we all do this whether we know we are or not. So if I ask you, what does the Bible teach about angels? You're going to go through various scriptures in Scripture, some that are more clear, some that are less clear, and that's going to inform what you say the Bible teaches about any given subject. Nod your head if you're with me. Systematic theology. It's not imposing something onto Scripture. It's looking in Scripture and understanding it, but from a topical point of view. So that's systematic theology. Biblical theology would be the counterpart to that, that enriches Scripture that much more. Biblical theology focuses more on the narrative or the history of redemption in Scripture? What is the story of the Bible? How does it play itself out? And so that, this is why I love covenant theology, that it's the best of both worlds. It's systematic. It's taking pieces and parts and understanding them in a topical kind of way, but it's also not losing the rich story nature of what Scripture is. Covenant theology. So covenant theology recognizes that redemptive history is revealed in Scripture as a succession of covenants covenant with Adam, and you'll see this on your handout. Summarization, comparison of biblical covenants. Y'all can be looking at this the whole day as we walk through what covenant theology is. Covenant theology simply recognizes that the story of Scripture is revealed in a succession of covenants or promises, and we'll talk more about the word covenant, what that means. So promises to Adam, promises to Noah, promises to Abraham, promises to Moses, promises to David, and the new covenant promises to us in Jesus. That's covenant theology. And so, as we read the Bible, a, a, an, organizing, uh, an organizing structure or an organizing principle of God's Word is revealed as we study it. And what we see is a unity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Interesting that the Testament is simply the Latin word for covenant. So when you look at your Bible, it's divided into Old Testament, New Testament. It's speaking to that covenant nature of what Scripture is. There's an old covenant, and there's a new covenant. Unity, continuity between the old and the new, that what was revealed in the Old Testament in a shadow or in a type is fulfilled perfectly in Jesus. And covenant theology, sometimes we can understand something best by understanding what it's not. Covenant theology differs from our brothers and sisters in Christ who are more in a dispensational theology line, right? And that's actually, I'll talk about it at the end. That's how my family came to faith in Christ. It's through dispensational Bible churches. Love them. How fantastic are they? But covenant theology differs in the way that we read the Bible and what we see in Scripture. Dispensational theology sees harder lines between old and new, kind of an intense distinction between Israel and the church, whereas covenant theology sees more that it's unity, it's union, that the people of God in the Old Testament is Israel, the people of God in the New Testament is the church. There are also subtle differences in the way we read Scripture, um, prophetic and apocalyptic 
scriptures are kind of read a little bit more literally in other traditions than in covenant theology. We're not going to go into the, into the weeds of all that. I see your eyes kind of glazing over already as I talk. We are not going to go into the weeds too much, but I just wanted to lay that out there so you kind of know, kind of, you kind of have a framework of where we're going. So, it's, when, when we look at the Scripture and we see this divided into Old and New Covenants, Old and New Testaments, we see, that, and that's, this simply reflects the fact that his, the history of God's people is fundamentally divided up between the Old Covenant that God made with Moses before Israel entered the Promised Land, and the New Covenant, which was accomplished by Christ. So, where does it come from? Let's look at the word itself, and I believe these two words are written on your handout. The word covenant comes from a word in Hebrew, berit, which has to do with cutting, making a promise, a bond in blood, you could say, a promise or relationship by way of blood. In the New Testament, that's reflected in the word diatheke. Okay, in Latin, that became testamentum, pactum, it has to do with agreement. It has to do with a, a bond, a life and death bond. So let's look at a few different definitions of covenant that have worked themselves out in history and in theology. St. Augustine said that a covenant was an agreement between two or more persons. That's, that's legally binding, okay? That's one way to view it. Um, the relationship, and, and what we understood, so from St. Saint, Saint Augustine's time until now, we've learned a lot about ancient Near East cultures, Mesopotamia and that all, whole area, and the way that they made promises to one another, legally binding promises. Okay, so the relationship of a covenant in the culture in which the Old Testament was written, there was this understanding of there was an overlord and there was a servant, or there was a king, there was a servant, or there were two people who were working together to, to either farm, grow land together, but they had to establish what is the relationship. They had to have that DTR, define the relationship. There's no laughs there. There was no laugh. It was not a good joke, but I didn't get anything. So Klein and Deisman, in their work on ancient Near East studies, showed us a lot of what um, suzerain vassal treaties have to do, where you have a lord and you have a vassal, and then there's an agreement that takes place. A, ro- a royal grant would be a covenant where the Lord or the king makes a promise and says, I will. I am making a promise. I will do this for you as my servant. But then a suzerain vassal treaty was more of a we will, where two parties are making a promise to one another, and it's a life and death promise. Ligon Duncan defines a covenant this way. A covenant is a binding relationship with blessings and obligations. I think that O. Palmer Robertson is one of my favorite theologians. Um, His definition is super helpful, and a lot of what you're going to hear today comes from his book, if you want a recommendation to do further reading. Christ of the Covenants is a book that I'd recommend if you want to dive deeper into what covenant theology is. O. Palmer Robertson puts it this way, a covenant is a bond in blood sovereignly administered. A bond in blood sovereignly administered, that God is making a promise to his people and he's securing that promise by blood. Life and death promise. So it's not only solemn, it's a matter of life and death. So as we look at what a covenant is in scripture, uh, there's an overarching principle that kind of flows each and through each and every one of these covenants. Covenants with Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Israel, David, and the new covenant through Jesus. And this is the Emmanuel principle. Okay, yeah, thanks. We can, leave, we can leave that slide up for those who are watching at home. The Emmanuel principle. From beginning to end, Scripture is about God establishing a relationship with his people. He is making a people for himself. And there's this repeated phrase that we see through Scripture. I will be your God, you will be my people, and I will dwell among you. Do you hear that connective language? God is making a promise, I will be yours, you will be mine, but not only that, I will dwell with you. And that's not just true of Jesus, that's true of every single one of the covenants that we see from the beginning of the Old Testament to the end of the New Testament. Leviticus 26, 11 and 12 says it this way, I will make my dwelling among you. You hear that piece of it? Dwelling, presence. I will make my dwelling among you and my soul shall not hate you. I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. Ezekiel 36, 27, and 28. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey all my rules. 
You shall dwell in the land I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. We may breeze past this language because it's so ubiquitous through Scripture. I will be your God, you will be my people, I'm going to live with you. When Christ is born, you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. It's over and over and over again. Jeremiah 11, Genesis 26, Joshua 3. I could go through many different scriptures that have this Emmanuel principle that show that it's, it's in the fabric of what scripture is telling us about God establishing a relationship with his people. All right, y'all track with me here. Covenant theology then is simply tracing God's ways and means of dwelling with his people. How does God accomplish his, this goal of dwelling with his people and winning for himself, growing for himself, birthing for himself a family, a family of God? Covenant theology is simply, it simply traces God's mains, ways and means of dwelling with his people from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. And it answers the question, how can a holy God call and dwell with a sinful people? That's a problem, Right? How can a holy God say, you will be mine, I will be yours, and I will dwell with you if he is holy and we are not? So, covenant theology, the Emmanuel principle defined and explained by another one of my favorite theologians, Sally Lloyd-Jones. Hey, here she is right here. I didn't even know this. We have a stack of these on the stage. If you've not read the Jesus Storybook Bible, you should. It's fantastic. Here's how she puts it. This is in her chapter on, essentially, the covenant of works, the covenant of creation with Adam, after they break the covenant, moving into the covenant of grace. You see, no matter what, in spite of everything, God would love his children with a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. And though they would forget him and run from him, deep in their hearts, God's children would miss him always and long for him, lost children yearning for their home. Before they left the garden, God whispered a promise to Adam and Eve. It will not always be so. I will come to rescue you. And when I do, I'm going to do battle against the snake. I'll get rid of the sin and the dark and the sadness that you let in here. I'm coming back for you. And he would. One day, God himself would come. A beautiful way of simply saying, I will be your God. You will be my people, and I will dwell with you. So, looking at your comparison of biblical covenants, right there, if you're going to talk about the history of redemption, you've got to have charts, right? I don't have any graphs for you, but I do have charts. We're going to start at the beginning with Adam, and we're going to walk through very briefly. Guys, we could do a full Sunday school class on each one of these covenants, but we've just got to hit them real fast just to understand what's happening, okay? So let's start with Adam. You see, I've provided for you a key word, a key text, a key sign, uh, the context of that covenant, and the type of covenant, and that'll make more sense as we go through each one. The first covenant that we see fleshed out in Genesis 1 and 2 is called the covenant of works or the covenant of creation. In Hosea 6, verses 6 and 7, we read this, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Hearts turn toward God instead of burnt offerings. And this is the key. Listen to this carefully. Just like Adam, they have broken the covenant. They were unfaithful to me there. Now, here's the thing. The reason I read from Hosea first when we're talking about Genesis chapters 1 and 2 is because many will say, wait a second, the word covenant, Berit, does not appear in Genesis 1 and 2. But we're reading backwards. Hosea shows us that the relationship that God had with Adam even before sin was one that reflected a covenant. The first time Berit appears, the first time the word covenant appears in the Old Testament is actually in Genesis chapter 6 when God is speaking to Noah and making a covenant there. So why would we understand God's relationship to Adam even before sin and after sin as a covenant? We know from what we see in Scripture and the various covenants that we're talking about and also from the study of these ancient Near East cultures that every covenant has certain characteristics. And I've written them up here. They're also in your notes. Every covenant has certain parties that are making a promise. So if it's a bond and blood sovereignly expended, a life and death promise, who's, who's involved? God and Adam in the first covenant. There are blessings and there are promises. There are requirements, 
There are obligations. There are consequences, and there are curses. There are signs, and there are sacraments. Let's flesh this out with an illustration that we're familiar with. Covenant marriage, okay? Who are the parties in a covenant marriage? There's one more party. There we go. Thank you. God is deeply involved in that covenant, okay? Three parties in the covenant of marriage. What are the blessings and the promises? I love silence, by the way. Y'all are all sitting so far away from me. <laughs> Children? What, do we make vows? Like we make promises to one another? Till death do us part? There's the life and death nature of it, right? Exclusivity, faithfulness. Okay, so what are the requirements and the obligations? If we want those blessings, there are actually requirements and obligations. What are those? Love, protect, honor, honor, faithfulness, exclusivity, just like Grafton already mentioned. Okay, what are the consequences and the curses? Are there consequences for breaking these? For breaking the requirements, the obligations? And what are the signs? So I wear on my finger an outward sign of an inward reality. Does that make sense? It's picturing on the outside what is true on the inside. We'll talk more about the sacraments, but that's what these are as well. They're outward signs that reveal what's true on the inside. The relationship is already there. The sign, the covenant, is simply making it official. Okay? So let's look at the covenant of works. We're going to spend a little bit more time on Adam because he's going to help us understand the rest of them. So what are the parties in, the, in uh, Genesis 1 and 2? God and Adam. Eve hasn't even been created yet. Okay? What are the blessings and the promises for Adam? Eternal life. You will live forever with me in this garden. Okay? What are the requirements and the obligations? I hear some mumbling out there. Don't eat of the tree of, yeah, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the, that's the prohibition. What are the consequences and curses? You will surely die. You will die, die in Hebrew. That means really die, spiritually die. Uh, what are the signs and the sacraments or the sacrament? This one's a little tough. Calvin actually calls the tree of life a sacrament for Adam. Isn't that interesting? He has an outward sign of what God promises to him in the covenant. You will live forever. And here is the tree of life that you have. Do you see it? Parties, blessings, requirements, consequences, and a sign. So that's what was true of Adam. Opalma Robertson says this, One tree stands in the midst of the garden as a symbolic reminder that man is not God. The test is Adam's willingness to choose obedience for obedience alone. The raw word of God itself must become the basis of man's action. You see, in, in the garden, before the fall, perfect obedience was the requirement. That's how intimacy with God was maintained. Adam was free to obey and free to sin. He had the ability to obey in the garden. Mankind, made in God's image, was able to turn and obey freely, in love and not by force, yet freedom opened the possibility for disobedience. The consequence and curse of breaking that covenant, disobeying God, was physical, spiritual, and eternal death. Separation from the source of life, figured in banishment from the tree of life, and actuated in a separation from communion with God. Friends, the covenant with Adam, the covenant of creation, is the default mode of the human life when you're born into this world. You are born into a covenant of works. We know that the wages of sin is death. Why? Because in Adam all die. But in Christ all are made alive. We read that in Romans, right? That's why disobedience cost humanity what it did. Because there was a life and death promise that God had made with Adam right there in the garden before sin even happened. And he provides for Adam a sign, the tree of life to look to, to remind him of eternal life. And God made us, 
knowing how he made us and graciously, graciously provides for us pictures and kinesthetic experiences to support, remind, and affirm his verbal and written promises and commands. So thus, in light of Hosea 6, we know that Adam and all mankind, according to Romans 5, are bound by a covenant simply by being created. This is our relationship with God. I'll be your God, you'll be my people, I will dwell among you. And here's how that fleshes itself out. So eternal life for Adam was dependent on his own obedience, but he broke the covenant. What does that mean for us? Friends, we have to walk away from here today knowing that you are saved by works. But the good news for you and for me is that we are saved by the works of another that are given to us now as a free gift. So look at the far right column. That first covenant was a covenant of works, covenant of creation. What's, what word characterizes every single other covenant from there on forward? Say it a little louder for the people in the back. We have to be saved by grace, by the works of Jesus, imputed to us, given to us as a free gift, if we are to have any hope for life in this world. So, let's talk about the covenant of grace. If the covenant of works describes God's relationship to creation prior to sin, the covenant of grace describes it subsequent to sin. So let's look at the covenant with Adam that was made in Genesis chapter 3. This is a covenant of commencement. This is getting the grace of God started in the world. So Adam broke the covenant, and God took away the picture and the promise, the tree of life and eternal life. And what kind of curses do we see in Genesis chapter 3? To the blessing of intimacy and marriage and childbirth were added the curse of pain. To the blessing of work was added the curse of toil and the thistles and thorns of sin. Those were the curses that were added. But the good news is that God did not finish the story there. He was going to make a new covenant. Not a plan B, but a more beautiful, richer promise. When we look at the covenants of Scripture, it's not God changing plans. Oh, well, that didn't work, so let's do this. It's like a scroll, which is how they would have read. It's being slowly unrolled. You're seeing more and more and more of what God is doing, but at the time, you can't see what He's doing. It's also progressive. God's covenants get better and better and better as we go from Adam to Noah to Abraham, to Moses, to David, to Jesus. God told the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The gospel in Genesis chapter 3, Christ will come and defeat the evil one so that I will be your God, you will be my people, and I will dwell with you. This seed the promised mediator of a better covenant would grow back into a tree of life. We see that in Revelation 22, where the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Do you see that imagery? We see it in Isaiah as well, that the tree that was chopped down will grow a shoot of Jesse. So if the picture of the promise for Adam the first time was the tree of life, now it's a seed. But it's a seed of the woman, that a child of Eve would come to redeem God's people. So from here on out, God's relationship with people must be dependent on grace alone and trust in the seed of the woman alone. So you also see the context of the covenant. Look at the um, second column from right. What starts with one man grows into a couple, grows into a family, grows into a nation, grows into a kingdom, and one day will be manifested in all of creation. the outreaching grace of God slowly spreading through history and redemption. Isn't that beautiful? The, these leaves of the tree slowly spreading out to make all things new. That's the covenant of grace. Okay, we, we have not talked nearly enough about Adam, but we've got to turn, because we don't have time, to Noah. This is a covenant of, of preservation, okay? To Noah, God said in Genesis 6, 18, I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark. God kept his promise to preserve and protect his people, and he did it through this time through a whole family. As we will see as we continue to unfold this scroll of redemption, God focuses his covenant love on families. God's promises are to families in a very real way. Genesis 9, 12 through 15, And God said, This is a sign of the covenant I am making between you and 
and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. God had promised I will crush the seed of the serpent, but the seed of the serpent is there. And this is the first instance of God preserving his people against the seed of the serpent. Does that make sense? That picture of literally, you will be safe in this ark. You will be safe in my grace. Come into the ark and you will be preserved from death. That's what the covenant of Noah means when we look back on it. And so this is an escalation of the goodness and the promises of God. God will preserve his people through the judgment that he sends on the seed of the serpent. For his people, his war bow, and the word is a bow, bow and arrow, it will be hung in the clouds. The imagery there is as if a warrior is putting away his weapons of war. Isn't that interesting? And Sally Lloyd-Jones says that the bow, this is, a, this is a wonderful interpretation, the bow is actually pointing into the heart of heaven instead of down onto those who are guilty. God is hanging his bow in the clouds. He is no longer at war with the people, his people, the people of God. It's no coincidence that the judge of heaven and earth in Revelation 4.3 is surrounded by a rainbow. God's promises fulfilled even before Christ came. Next, Abraham. This is a covenant of promise. God, in Genesis 15.5, God took Abram outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your children be. So let's, re- let's recount the signs. For Adam, in Genesis 1 and 2, the sign is a tree of life. For Adam, in, in Genesis 3, the sign was the seed of the woman. For Noah, it was the rainbow. And Abraham actually gets three signs, you could say. He's to look at the stars and remember that's how his family shall be. There will be a ceremony we'll talk about in just a second, and circumcision. Those are the signs of the Abrahamic covenant. In Ur, Abram would have been worshiping the heavenly bodies, the sun and the moon. He was a pagan worshiper, worshiping the sun and the moon. And now God makes him look past the very things he was worshiping to see that he is the God, the one true God behind the stars. He not only promises an enormous family, a heritage, right? He also promises that that family would bless the whole world. That's the extent of the covenant of Abraham. It will be a blessing to all the world. So, an old man and his old wife are having a baby, and that is a miracle, but there's a bigger miracle at play in Genesis 12, 15, and 17. The Bible says that Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Abraham was saved by faith alone, through grace alone. He didn't know it, but it was through Christ alone. Isn't that amazing? The way of salvation in the Old Testament was the exact same way that we are saved by faith in God, and that credited to us by grace. So here's what we need to see. Abraham was saved the same way that you and I are on this side of the cross. So the key text, and you'll see them there under Abraham, Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 17. So in Genesis chapter 12, God makes a promise to Abraham. And in Genesis chapter 15, chapters 15 and 17, God confirms his promises. So what, here's what we're going to do. In Genesis chapter 15, we see a covenant ceremony. I'll read from verse 17. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. Well, what pieces? I need some volunteers. I need five volunteers. Come on. Two, come on up. Samuel Bolin, come on up. God told, come on, Grafton. Very good. I need a female volunteer. Come on, Sarah Love. God had Abram collect animals, and this would have been common in the culture. Take the animals, and I want you to cut them in half. Okay, so, and I'd prefer long ways, okay. like straight down the midline, rather than like this. That would be easy. So cut this in half for me. And once you're done, I want you to place it on either side of the aisle. 
I still left the tags on. When I do this with kids, they're, they're really like, this is not okay. <laughs> but they remember it for the rest of their lives. And I have a feeling you guys will too. I'll pull out the vacuum cleaner before the 11 o'clock service. So put one half on one side, one half on the other side. This was a common way of expressing a covenant promise in those days, right? So with the suzerain vassal treaty, they come together, you cut the animals in half, you lay the animals on either side, and then you, together you walk between the pieces, okay? Oh, there's lots of fluffy stuff coming out. I love it. Blazes is very cleanly cut. I'm impressed. Man, good work. He had a better animal. He had a better animal. <laughs> See, and Sarah Love is going about ripping. Just rip it apart. I don't have time for scissors. Grafton's having trouble. It's okay. Did I give you a bad pair of scissors? That was on purpose. That was on purpose. Great job. Y'all can go sit down. Thank you. I'm glad we don't have any real blood. In Genesis 15, this would have been very bloody. I didn't want it to be so today. Great job, everybody. So what would happen is that God would call the people together. Not, well, people would come together in a, in a human covenant. They would cut these animals apart, and they would walk between. And what that was saying is that if I break the covenant, the same thing that happened to these animals should happen to me. And if you break the covenant, the same thing that happened to these animals should happen to you. That's what makes it a blood promise. This is a life and death promise of faithfulness. I will keep my promise. Do you remember, though, what happened to Abraham during this ceremony? Where was Abraham during this ceremony? He was asleep. God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Abraham, very similar to what happened to Adam. Deep sleep. And then a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch which is so cool. It pre prefigures, how was God with his people in the wilderness to lead them through the wilderness? A column of smoke by day and fire by night. Whoa. Right? And those, walk, those pass through the pieces. What was God saying? God was saying, if I break the covenant, I die. And if Abram breaks the covenant, I die. It's a self-maledictory oath. I'm calling this upon myself. If, if the people of God break this covenant, if they break God's promise, God is going to die. This is in Genesis chapter 15, folks. There is continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and Jesus is just the culmination of these promises. Isn't that beautiful? That's the covenant with Abram with Abraham. God dies either way. And then God gives another picture of the promise, circumcision, a reminder that God was cutting away all that did not belong in Abraham's heart. And guys, we're just going to go there, right? The sign was on a reproductive organ, that God's working through human reproduction, would, he would use that to save the world. The seed of the woman would save the world. A physical reminder that doesn't get much more closer to home, for Abram and his sons to remember God's promise. And we read in Genesis 17, 12, that it's open to strangers. From the beginning, the covenant was open to Gentiles. Circumcision was not a racial badge of purity, but a covenant sign. With the advent of the Holy Spirit, Gentiles no longer have to become Jews to enter the covenant. That's what most of the pastoral epistles are about, right? Right? Most of the epistles are about Gentiles not having to become Jews in order to become Christians. Acts 15, Galatians 5. Re listen to this in Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 11. In Him, this is in Christ, also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Do you see what Paul just did there in Colossians? He connected baptism and circumcision. Baptism and circumcision, signs of the covenant. This is what O'Palmer Robertson says. The interconnection between the seal of circumcision and the seal of the Holy Spirit provides the formal basis by which the corresponding purification rites of the Old and New Covenants relate to one another. What just happened? What did we just say? That was a little rough. 
This is what it means. Circumcision under the old covenant is replaced by baptism in the new covenant. Barry hit on this last week when he talked about the sacraments. Circumcision under the old covenant is replaced with baptism in the new covenant. And the emphasis in Colossians 2 is that all this happens in him, in Christ. Union with Christ is the means by which we are cleansed. Abram believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So baptism does picture the dying and being raised with Christ, the signifying of our cleansing. In it, a circumcision of the heart takes place or a circumcision of the heart is pictured as taking place. How beautiful that in the new covenant, the waters of baptism are for men and women, the sons and daughters of God, and that there is no more blood there's no more blood. Abram's bloody ceremony, um, Passover, which we'll talk about in a second, is replaced with the, the water and the bread. And circumcision, that bloody covenant, is replaced with this right here. A picture that God loved us before we were even aware of it. That while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. There's, I, I didn't say anything just then. Like, we have just scratched the surface on the covenant with Abraham. But it, I, I see that you guys are kind of tracking with me, so let's keep going. God's covenant with Moses and with all of Israel. This is a covenant of law, and that might kind of throw a few of you thinking the wrong way, because look at the last word there. What, what kind of type is the covenant with Moses and covenant with Israel still? It's still of grace. It's still of grace. Think about the sheer scale of growing from a family in, of, into a people, into a nation. All of a sudden, the people of God are living. They've, they've, God gives them deliverance. They escape Egypt in the Exodus, and now they've got to live and walk with God God's way. How are they to know how to live? And God graciously provides for them a picture of the promise and a law by which to know how can we please God? How can we live how can we stay alive? Not just things like don't touch dead bodies. That's good wisdom that God gave to his people, that you would stay clean, right? But how can, how can you not kill yourself with sin? Because sin will kill you. That's what the covenant with Moses and with Israel is all about. It was an external summary of God's will, how to walk with God God's way for their own protection from sin and death. And so whether the law was civil, ceremonial, or moral, it was all intended to graciously guide, God, guide God's people into a way of loving God and loving others. That's what the Ten Commandments are, right? You shall love the Lord your God with heart, mind, soul, and strength. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the moral law. That continues until Christ comes back. There are ceremonial, there are civil laws that pass away. Because, what did we say about covenants? They progress. And they do change. But it's still about the grace of God. Exodus 19, then Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to God's people. You have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasure. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The law could never save Israel, and it could never save you. And even if you could, keeping the Ten Commandments would win for you a plot of land in the Middle East. <laughs> Is that the promise that we want? A plot of land in, you know, the, the promised land, that promised land would be nice, but we are promised so much more. And thus, breaking that covenant meant that Israel could not have that promised land, and they were carried off into exile. The law could never save them. We need a new law from a new mountain, from a new mediator, bringing a new covenant. Where do we see a new mediator standing on a mountain bringing a new law under a better covenant? There was a mount where there was a sermon that happened. Some might call it the sermon on the mount where Jesus stood as a better mediator for the people of God. Do you see it? Better than Moses. 
a better mediator. Now, there's some disagreement here, but I believe that God's covenant with Moses is not a republication of the covenant of works, but still a manifestation of the covenant of grace. Remember, deliverance from the Exodus had already happened. Their deliverance from Exodus was not a result of their obedience. Do y'all hear me? The law came after they were saved. The law came after their rescue. Their obedience to the law then was a response to the grace of God, not a way to win the grace of God, even for Israel. But Israel lost the blessings of this covenant and experienced the consequences, but God was no less gracious. Because covenants do have consequences. Even if there are blessings and promises and God will all, always keep his promises, there are consequences to disobedience. In our modern Christianity, can we abide both blessings and curses? Can we abide promises and requirements? Can we hold in tension the fact that a gracious God can give both grace and consequences to us for sin? It's hard. It's hard to understand suffering. It's hard to understand consequences. But we see that fleshed out in the covenants God makes. Once again, haven't even touched it. The picture that God gives for his people, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, where once a year the priest would go and put blood on the mercy seat. And what was underneath the mercy seat? Do y'all remember the three things that were in the Ark of the Covenant? Aaron's staff, budding staff, which was a picture of the people's refusal to acknowledge the leadership God had given them. The manna, which represented the people's inability to trust that God would provide for them, bread from heaven, and then the Ten Commandments, which were broken when Moses came and threw them on the ground when they were worshiping the golden calf. The priest would go in, and he'd sprinkle the blood of an innocent lamb on that mercy seat. And the, the Ark of the Covenant was essentially a picture of a footstool of God's throne. As if God is in heaven and here's his footstool, he's dwelling with his people wherever they go in the tabernacle. Emmanuel principle. So that when God the Father looked down from heaven, he saw innocent blood covering over the sins of the people underneath. The grace of God with them everywhere they went. That was the Ark of the Covenant, a sign of the covenant that they could see. Now, let's turn to David, and we're not going to do justice to David at all. This is a covenant of kingdom represented in the throne of David. And we see this in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where God formally establishes the manner which he shall rule his people through a king. So it moves from a nomadic nation in the wilderness to, with, that had a mobile sanctuary, a tabernacle that went with them wherever they were, and now all of a sudden there is a kingdom at Mount Zion. Y'all remember the Ark of the Covenant was brought to Jerusalem, and David is king. The fulfillment that God will reign over his people, security and safety for the people of God in Jerusalem. God associates his kingship with the throne of David and promises that a king from David's family would reign forever if they would follow the Lord. Yet, we know that, and we're going to talk about it this week at VBS, Ahab, just one of many evil kings in the life of Israel and Judah that did not follow the Lord. So Nebuchadnezzar came through and just decimated Israel, and there was no king on the throne, even though God had promised there will always be a king on the throne. God, what are you doing? Had God forgotten his covenant? No. A greater son of David was already and not yet reigning. A greater son was already reigning. David's line anticipated in shadow the eternal character of the reign of Jesus Christ. And this messianic redeemer was to unite the throne of David with the throne of God. In in, uh, 1 Chronicles 29, we read that Solomon sat on the throne of Yahweh as king, a man sitting on the throne of God. That's the promise. It's getting better and better and better. Next, new covenant in Christ, pictured in the water and the bread and the wine. Jeremiah 31 tells us that it's coming, that a new covenant is coming. Let's read it together. Jeremiah 31, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors. Do you see that there's now some discontinuity? It will not be like those covenants. When I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds 
and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say one to another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Jeremiah is giving a sneak peek into the fulfillment of all these promises, that all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus Christ. Acts 2, 38 and 39 says this, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, all whom the Lord our God will call. The covenant of God, a blessing to families, a sign given to us and to our children, which we're witnessing today in worship. How beautiful is that? A table, a covenant meal that we're going to gather together and we're going to eat this meal in remembrance of who God is and what he has done for us. It's a meal of celebration. It's not a re-sacrifice of Jesus, okay? It's not just a remembrance. It's a covenant meal for the people of God to gather together and celebrate and be united to one another. Luke 22, Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. That's where we get that language of new covenant from Jeremiah and from Jesus' own words. This is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. That's the imagery of that cup. It's imagery from Passover, which we didn't even touch on when we talked about God's covenant with Moses. We couldn't do justice to it. Jesus drank the cup of wrath and curses, drank it down to the dregs so that we could receive the cup of celebration and blessing and promises. Do you see that? Every time we take communion, we're remembering the covenant love of God, that Jesus did not drink a sweet cup, but a bitter one on our behalf. That's the new covenant. So, what are the implications of covenant theology? Where does this get real for us? This has just been a basic overview. Great, we've got like, wait, no, it's 1030. We've got to be done, don't we? And I'm the guy who's always telling you to to go. We got five minutes? Okay, here we go. We cannot fathom, fathom the meaning of the death of Christ without Adam's seed, Noah's rainbow, Abraham's ceremony, Israel's ark, and David's throne. It teaches us what the death of Christ is all about. Without the story and these signs, we cannot fathom the meaning of our sacraments. Sacraments confirm an already existing relationship. It does not begin them. Remember, Abraham was circumcised after he believed. The signs don't make, the sign did not save his children. Ishmael was circumcised. And Ishmael was not part of the people of God. But they confirm and picture what can be true, what is true for us in Jesus, in the covenant. But here's the thing. This, this idea of covenant signs can, make, can seem uncomfortable to our modern ears because there's kind of this idea of me and Jesus. It's individualism. It's me and Jesus, and that's how I'm saved. Instead, God does work in communities and he works in families and he keeps his promises to families. Baptism does not save your child, but it is a picture, a sign, a seal that God's love is true. God loves us before we are able to love and so we respond in thankful faith. The Lord's Supper is a covenant meal where we remember the promises of God. So, without the covenants, we cannot taste the rich beauty of Scripture as one story. In the second century, Eusebius calls Irenaeus a zealous defender of the covenant of Christ, who sat under Papias, who sat under John, who sat under Jesus. So if you read Irenaeus, you'll see the progress of redemption that you see in O. Palmer Robertson's The Christ of the Covenants. Covenant theology was not an invention of the Reformation. It's the story of Scripture described for us for our good and benefit. And without the covenants, we cannot fathom the depths of God's love and grace to us in salvation, that his promises enable and fuel our, our personal responsibility as we rest completely in his sovereignty. God's love for you is not dependent on anything you do or anything that you don't do. Abraham was asleep, 
Christ died for you. A quick story and then we'll be done. Jack and Kelly Owens met in grad school in New Orleans. They grew up in nominal Christian homes. And a Bible church classmate of theirs shared the gospel with them. They, my mom actually just recently told me that TV evangelists actually kind of planted the scene. I just love that story. They were watching like TV evangelists and started to be convicted of their need for Christ. And then when I was about third grade, my dad discovered the grace of God, shown to him in scripture with the help of some books he was reading. And from there on out, I was constantly told this story that, Zach, your, God's love for you is not dependent on anything that you do or anything that you don't do. And I know this is unique to me, but in my own personal story, I have not struggled to know that God loves me. I know deeply that God loves me. I've not actually struggled with that. My struggle has been to know that I am loved and accepted just as I am by other people. That's a, that's a tougher struggle for me. Covenant theology tells us that God wins for himself, not individuals, but a covenant people of God. Do you hear me? Growing from a person to a family to a nation to a kingdom into all of creation. This is the spot where Scripture's story of the covenant of love has been a balm to my own soul. Not only am I safe and secure in God's love as an individual, but I am bonded life and death to the people of God, enjoying together all the rights and privileges of the children of God. So friends, when betrayal and hurt happen, which is inevitable when you're living in community with, Christian, with other sinners, there is an anchor for our souls. You belong to a covenant community, and we can hope that the Bible story of covenant bonds today anchors your soul in God's love for you and spurs us on to love one another in covenant community. As a kid, when I heard about covenant communities, I thought about the neighborhoods a few towns over where you couldn't park your bike in the driveway and weren't allowed to have a basketball goal. That's a covenant community. I didn't want to live there. But now I'm in covenant community. And it's a balm to my soul. And I hope that it is to yours. That's what covenant community does for us. That's why we raise our hands for the people who are having their children baptized, that we will be in covenant community with them. That's why we do this together and not individually. We're the people of God, saved by his covenant love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time, however short it was. I pray that you would write the truth of your word onto our hearts, and as we understand it deeper, Lord, that it would not puff us up with knowledge, but Lord, that it would draw us into a deeper love for you and spur us on to love one another. Thank you for your covenant love. Thank you for working through families. Thank you for giving us pictures to remind us because we are so forgetful. Thank you for these dear people, and I pray that you would bless them as they leave here today. And it's in your precious name I pray. Amen. Thanks, everybody.